Now, the title of my sermon this morning is called Which Church? And the goal of this sermon is, is to help you to be able to determine what are the important factors when deciding what church that you should be going to. Now, I know that you know, we have people in here today that might not be here for very long. You might uh, have plans on moving away. But ultimately, we need to know what is a good place to start a church. You know, there's going to be visitors that come and go. And we, we've had plenty of visitors that have, that have come and gone through this church. And unfortunately, we live in a day where a lot of people... Um, base things, base the reason why they're coming to church on, on reasons that aren't really that, that important. Uh, for example, I got a call yesterday asking, the only question they asked was, do you have a nursery? Now, we obviously don't have a nursery here. Um, this is a family integrated church. I believe it's important for the families all to stay together. I could understand why some people, that's a benefit for them to be able to drop their children off and to be able to completely focus and pay attention during church. I get that. I, I understand those reasons. But that is not the reason why you should base on whether or not you're going to attend a church is whether or not they have a nursery. I mean, for one, show me a nursery in the Bible. It doesn't exist. Actually, what you'll find to the contrary is people, uh, men and women and the little ones, all listening to the Word of God. This is what you're going to find in Scripture. But, um, you know, that's just one example. There's a lot of things that people look at. You know, some people are interested, in, well, what's the type of music? Some people, I get this a lot out soul winning, you know, what type of youth programs do you have? A lot of people like a big church. Some people like a small church. You know, uh, specific ministries that might be going on through the church. Does, does, the, does the church hold to certain standards? That's either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on who you talk to, uh, which Bible version is used, you know, what form of evangelism. All these different types of things are, are things that you might think about when deciding whether or not to come to a church. And I'm not saying all, any of those things are necessarily bad or wrong, but these are all different things that go through your mind. There's a lot of factors to think about. But we need to be able to prioritize when we're deciding what church we're going to attend and we're going to be a part of. We need to be able to decide, hey, what are the most important things that a church needs to have in order for me to make sure that I'm going to the right church? At least to say, I'm going to a good church. You know, people ask me from time to time, when I go out soul winning, you know, why did you start a church here? Prescott Valley, if you don't know this, Prescott Valley has a lot of churches. There are a lot of churches in town. So you could say, well, you're just another church. No, we're not just another church. And you're going to find out, you know, hopefully you know that already. You're coming to this church now. But we are not just your average church. This is not something that's being, you know, the, the things that we feel is important that we prioritize as a church, other churches aren't doing this. And this is what I believe to be the most important things. We're going to get into this here in just a minute. I think there's actually very few churches, good churches, based on what is truly important in any given area. And when you start to realize what things are actually the most important stuff, uh, you know, according to, to Scripture, choosing a church really won't be that difficult because you're going to be able to rule out a lot of churches right off the bat when we look at these reasons. Now, unfortunately, we live in a culture and a society where people have this have-it-your-way mentality. Right? They think like, well, I want the church that's best for me. How can the church just suit me? What are, you know, what are the programs that are going to fit me? What can the church give to me? And, and what do I like the most? Oh, I don't really like that music so much. I want more trendy music. I want more popular music. Oh, I don't like this. I don't, you know, and people get real picky and they want to have this, this pick and choose and just have it their way type of a church, which is a completely wrong attitude. Instead of finding a church that's best for you, maybe you should alter your thinking to find the church where God wants you to be. Because that may not be the church exact, the exact church that you want to go to. But the church that God wants you to be at is the one that we ought to be more focused about. A place where God has chosen to put His name there. And that's why we started off this morning in Deuteronomy chapter number 12. Now, you may not have noticed this as we read through it, but there's at least four occasions where the Bible specifically mentions, because this is the children of Israel, God's giving them warning, He's, he's giving them a message, they're going into the promised land, and He's saying, look, there's going to be a place where I'm going to choose to put my name there. That's going to be the place that you're going to go. That's going to be the place you're going to bring your sacrifices to. That's going to be the place where you're going to go and worship me. And it's going to be the place that He chooses. The children of Israel did not choose where they were going to set up the tabernacle, where they were going to set up the temple. God chose that place. 
place. God said, this is where I want my, my name to be um, exalted. Deuteronomy chapter 12, look at verse number um, 5. The Bible says, But unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither thou shalt come. He's saying that's what you need to seek unto. The name, the place that I choose, you need to seek that place out and go to that place, the place that I'm choosing to put my name there. And this is the way, you know, I, I realize this is the Old Testament and they had it a little bit different because they had one, one central place that everybody would come to. Now in the New Testament, we have local churches, but it's the same concept. We need to find the place. Hey, where is God being exalted? Where is his name? Where does he consider to be a good church? And we need to find that church out and go and be a part of that church in order to make sure that we're right with God. And again, it may not exactly suit every little specific detail that you're, that you're looking for, but hopefully those details that you're looking for are actually something that God has ordained and that God wants to be a part of that church. And it's not just something that's a, you know, just a preference or something that you prefer um, that doesn't necessarily line up with Scripture. For example, the nursery, right? I mean, a nursery is nowhere in Scripture. Where are you going to show you that God saying, yes, my name is here because they have a nursery? You're not going to find that. That is, that is so far down the list of, of priorities. It shouldn't even be an important thing. I mean, we don't even have one. We won't ever have one. Because I do believe it's important to have the whole family together. There's a lot of things that are important. You know, people say, yeah, but my kids, are, they're little terrors. They, you know, they run around. Well, then you need to teach them how to sit down and be well during church. Now, look, I have one of my children just had to be taken out now. She's two years old. She needs to learn, right? And all children need to go through this phase. But if you want them to grow up and become, you know, adults that are able to sit through church and adults that are able to learn, they need to start from a young age. And you know what? Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me. He didn't say, go stick them in a place somewhere. And that's why he said the disciples were wanting to get rid of them. The disciples didn't want the hassle of the children. He said, no, no, suffer the little children to come unto me, for of such are the children of the kingdom of heaven. We need to become as little children. Little children are important. They need to hear the preaching of God just as much as anyone else does. And we can't put it past these kids and what they're able to pick up and what they're able to learn. Children are smart. And so many times, people just, just overlook that fact that kids are able to pick up a lot. I am amazed at what my daughters are able to, to t tell me after service sometimes. Even weeks later or months later, they'll be able to tell me something that they learned in church. When I don't think they're even paying attention, sometimes they're looking over here, they're playing with their fingers, doing all these other things. They look like they're not doing anything. No, they're listening. And they pick up things. Now, do they get everything? No. Of course not. There's some things that go over that, but they're learning. They're, they're building up that foundation of knowledge, and it's extremely important. But that's just one aspect, and that, you know what? That's not even one of my most important things. In Deuteronomy chapter number 12, we've got lots of verses here. Verse 11, verse 14, verse 18, verse 21, and verse 5, as we already read, that all say uh, there's a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. But in the place which the Lord shall choose. See, God is the one that's choosing the place. We need to make sure that we're finding the right place. So how can you tell where the Lord has chosen for you to attend church? These are three things that, for me, are deal breakers. If a church does not have these three things, then I will not even consider going there as a church. The only way I would consider going to, to a church, if it didn't meet these three criteria, is if I lived just completely in some area for hundreds of miles, there like are no churches. There's nothing around. I still am going to find a place, because the Bible says to forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. We need to be in church. We, we, you know, church attendance is extremely important. That God has ordained, and I'm going to get into this a little bit later too, pastors and teachers. He has given men to fill this office for a specific reason. You know, God has ordained the local church for a reason, not just for people to forsake it, but for people actually to attend and congregate and come together, worship the Lord, and be edified by one another and to learn doctrine. So church is very important, but we need to figure out, well, what's the right church? Now, my number one criteria 
should go without saying, but a place that believes salvation is by grace through faith alone and that it's eternal and you can never lose it. It can't be forfeited. There's so much scripture about this subject. Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If there's a church out there and they're preaching a work salvation, if they're teaching you that you have to give up all of your sins in order to be saved, if they're teaching you that you have to you know, be baptized to be saved, if you're teaching you that you have to do any other work or action other than just putting your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, that is not a valid church. They're not even saved. They don't even have salvation right. If they don't even have salvation right, how are you going to expect them to get anything else right? Salvation is the number one thing that a church must have. If a church doesn't have salvation right, I am never going to that church. I don't even care if I live in an area that has no other churches. If they don't have salvation right, I am not going to that church because it's not a real church. I mean, a church is a congregation of believers. If everybody in the congregation is believing that you have to do works in order to be saved, then you aren't in church. You're not congregating with believers. You're congregating with people who are unsaved that think that their good works are getting them to heaven. I mean, that's why I'll never set foot in a Catholic church and say, oh, well, this is the only church in my, in my town, so I'm going to the Catholic church. No. They're way off base. They're wrong. They, they, don't even, they don't even have salvation right. It's not a real church. Number two, the number two thing that I think is extremely important, and these don't even necessarily have to be in any particular order. I, I put them in the order that I think is important, but all three of these are, I think, are pretty much equally important. A place where His Word is preached. God's Word. Not some perversion of man. I don't want to hear some of God's words and some of man's words and have to try to figure out which ones are God's and which ones are man's. We're a King James Bible only church because that is where God has decided to preserve his word in the English speaking language for us today. And I'm not going to go through all of the, the proof texts about this. I have entire sermons preaching why do we believe in the King James Bible. But just one verse in Psalm chapter 12 the Bible says the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The burden of the preservation of God's word is given unto God. God is the one who needs to preserve his word. It's not left up to man to do it because people say, oh, well, man makes mistakes. Yes, I know man makes mistakes, but God doesn't. So if God is preserving, if God is keeping his word from this generation and forever when he, when he spake this in the time of David, in the Psalms, then his word continues on forever. And I believe that. And I believe it's around there somewhere. So then the next task is saying, well, where is it? Is it in these corrupted new, new versions? In the ESV and the, the NASB and the HIV and all these other letters that you want to give for, the, for these perverted versions of the Bible? No, it's not. These, these new versions, they came out of the, the, the Westcott and Hort text, which is a corrupt text anyways, a different manuscript. And look, I'm not going to get into all the details on that. Listen to my sermons about why we're a King James only church, and you will get a lot more references, a lot more proof about that. But um, I think everybody here already believes these things. So those two, first two things, they have to have salvation by grace through faith, and they have to be using the King James Bible. They have to be teaching about that because otherwise you're not going to be getting pure doctrine. You're going to be getting, not even have a hope of getting pure doctrine. It's going to be coming from a false version. It's going to be corrupted. I want to come to church and hear God's word preached. And number three, I believe this is extremely important also, a place that is actively doing something to preach the gospel. Now, I'm not saying they have to do things exactly the way that we do them. I believe in door-to-door -door soul winning. I believe that going out, knocking on doors, and talking to people individually, and confronting them, and asking them if they know for sure they're saved, if they know they're going to heaven, and this type of soul, I think that's the best way to do it. I think it's a biblical way to do it. But if they have other ways, if they go out and, and talk to people in the marketplace, or if they, you know, as long as they're doing something, and they're actually preaching the Word of God, and they're actually telling people how to be saved, then that meets the criteria. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Real simple. Salvation is easy. Again, salvation by grace through faith. All you got to do is call on the name of the Lord through faith in your heart. And it gives you the rundown in Romans chapter 10 of how a person gets saved. What is required for a person to call on the name of the Lord? Verse 14 says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? 
I'm saying, obviously, you have to believe. You can't, you're not going to call on God if you don't believe on Him. If you're not putting your faith on God, you're not going to call out to Him to be saved. You have to believe. And how shall they believe in Him whom they have not heard? You can't believe something that you don't even know about. You have to have heard about it in order to believe it. Makes sense, right? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Well, in order to hear something, someone's got to tell it to you. Someone's got to explain it to you. You need a preacher to tell you these things. In verse 15, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Look, people aren't going to be going out and preaching the gospel of their own volition. It's not going to happen. You say, oh yeah, but I know this one person. Look, it might happen for a short period of time, but ultimately they're not going to go. And normally the only reason they even go out to do it to begin with is because they hear the preaching nowadays like online or they hear it from somebody else. They hear someone else sending them out. If, someone, if, if a church is not sending people out to preach the gospel, it's not going to happen. The job is not going to be done. And this is one of the things, one of the important uh, reasons to come to church and go to a church that is sending people out. Sending people out to go win souls. Hey, we're a church that does that. And you know what? This is what, this number three reason. I know that other places in this area, they've got salvation right. Their doctrine is great. They, they believe completely. It's 100% by, faith, by grace through faith. I believe, I'm not positive, I believe there are other churches in this area that also use the King James Bible. And they have salvation, right? And praise God for that. But you know what? I don't know of anybody that's going out and sending people out to preach the gospel to every creature, which is the Great Commission. This is the reason why we started this church here. We got, we got a, a, a city of over 40,000 people, a surrounding area of about 100,000 people. And as far as I know, nobody is going out and sending people to preach the gospel of peace. And this is one of the most important things. Hey, if a church isn't doing this, that church is going to die. You need to be actively going out and seeking and saving that which is lost. We need to be going. God has committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling the lost unto God. This is our job. These three things are the, the, the criteria that I will determine personally. And you, you know, make up whatever rules you want for yourself on determining a good, a good church. But I believe that, look, if you don't have salvation, it's not a church. If you don't have God's word, what are you learning from? Are you just going to learn the wisdom of man? And if a church isn't actually doing the work, the great commission, the job that Jesus Christ has given us to do, what's the point? We could all sit around. Then you might just have a social club. Right? You could just sit around and enjoy each other's company. And who cares? Let the whole world go to hell. You're saved. You could sit here. You could just enjoy each other and fellowship and then go home and you could live your life and just be just fine and content with that. You know what? A lot of people are just fine and content with that. And that's one of the reasons why you don't see this room completely packed out today. We've had plenty of people that come into this church and then they leave this church. And you know what? That's fine. Am I happy about that? No. I'd rather people come and say, stay and get plugged in and, and learn the Bible and learn to be a soul winner and learn to preach the gospel to other people. That's my, that's my intent. That's my heart. That's my desire. But I'm not going to chase people down and, and run after them to do anything that it takes just to get them to sit in the chair here. Because if your heart's not right, if you're willing to just go through life and... and, and not do anything for the Lord, then this isn't the right church for you. We're looking for people here that love God, that want to serve God, and that want to do what's right according to His will. And let God lead your path. And I'll tell you what, I, I would even do this. If, if I didn't have these three things, these three criteria met in an area that I lived in, I would start planning on moving. You know, people move for jobs all the time. All the time. And you know what? It's not a, it's not a weird thing. Be, you know, if, if you tell someone, hey, I've got this great job offer, but I have to move across the country to another state, nobody's going to think you're weird for doing that. Nobody will say, hey, well, great for you. Good for you. Yeah, go move your family over there. I know, you know, even if you're, you're planning here, all your family's here. Yeah, we're going to go. I got this great job offer, but it's over here. I'm going to go and do it. Nobody will think twice that that is a weird thing or a bad idea or, or you shouldn't be doing that. 
But now try telling somebody, yeah, you know what? I live in this area. I got a nice job. We're settled. My family's here. But there's no good churches here at all. There's no good churches. So I'm going to pick up my family. I'm going to move somewhere where I know there is a good church. And I'm going to attend that church. People will look at you like you have two heads. People say, well, you're moving for a what? A church? Why don't you? There's churches, there's churches all over the place. Why don't you go to one of these churches? But where is your priorities? Is your priorities on just making a lot of money in this world? Is that it? Are you just looking for the, mo the best paying job and that's what you want to do with your life? Hey, then go ahead and move for the job and, and place God and church and, and everything else lower than your income. Go ahead. People do it all the time. But as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. We're gonna, look, what's important to me is serving God. That is the most important thing in my life. Everything else comes secondary to the Lord. And I'm going to make sure that my family and my children grow up in a church that's preaching and teaching the Word of God, that we're not going to some watered-down liberal church that's getting rid of the, the traditional hymns and that's bringing in the, the worldly music so we can just teach our kids to be just like the world, that there's no difference between God's people and the heathen, and that we could just teach our children to, to grow up and be like everybody else in this world, in this God-forsaken world. It's not going to happen. Bringing up my family, my wife, my children in a God-fearing church among God's people that love God and want to serve Him, that's the place where I want my family to be. And if it means I have to pick up and move and go somewhere else, then that's what I would do. Now, thankfully, I don't have to do that. We've got a great church right here. Now, I did pick up my family and move to start one here because there isn't a church like this in the area. Nowhere around this area is there a church like this church. We are different. Most of these churches, you know, turn if you would to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. I have experienced this firsthand. Now, don't get me wrong. When I, when I start mentioning the differences in our church, it's not to lift ourselves up and just say, oh, we are so much better than anyone else. Look, there is a difference, though. And it's not because I'm proud and that, and that I want everyone to think, oh, Pastor Burzins, you're so great and you're so much better than everybody else. That's not the point at all. The point is to say, we love God and we're going to serve Him and we actually care about what His words say. We care about the whole counsel of God. I'm not going to just pick and choose and just, just have you come in here and get your little dose of spiritualness for the week so you could come in here and feel good and you could check it off and say, yeah, I went to church today. Yep, I feel real good now. I went to church. That's done. That's taken care of. Now that I could get through the week. We're not here to give you a little, a little booster shot of, of God. This church is here to see lives changed. We're here to show you and to teach you out of the Bible, out of God's Word, what He wants you to know. And things that are written plainly and clearly. And we're going to go through all of it. And guess what? There's going to be a lot of times where... It is great. It's a great message. And you are going to be lifted up and you're going to be edified. And that will maybe help you get through the week. But you know what? There's also going to be times where you're, you're going to feel like your face is getting ripped off because of the sin that's being exposed that's in your life that needs to be changed. It's going to happen. And you know what? That ought to be happening. And anybody who has a heart that loves God should want for that to happen. I don't want to continue doing things that's displeasing to God, that makes him angry, that just tacks on one more sin onto the shoulders of Jesus Christ who died and bled for my sins. I don't want to add more to that. I want to be good in God's sight. I want the Lord to say, well done, now good and faithful servant, as opposed to, why aren't you listening to me? Why aren't you doing what I said? I've given you the instruction. It's all right here. But there's plenty of churches, they won't touch that. This church will. 1 Peter chapter 2. I've, had, I've experienced this problem in plenty of churches. Even when I didn't have very much knowledge, I still would go to church and I feel like I'm not being fed. Like, you're not telling me anything that I don't know. You're not, you're not saying anything. You're reading the scripture, but then you just go on and babble for, for 30 minutes or however long about things that don't even matter. 
1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, we should be desiring to hear God's word. Just as a little baby loves to get his mother's milk, he desires that milk when he gets hungry. We as Christians, as newborn babes, should desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. The whole point is to grow. When you come here, uh, I will, and you know what? I've seen this happen. We don't have very many church members, but I have already seen in the two years of our existence, people have come and they have grown and they've grown in their spiritual life because they're hearing God's word. Because God's word has power. God's spirit has power. And when you're hearing that and when you're receiving that, you're going to grow thereby. And when people actually want to hear it, you know, if people don't want to hear it, they're not going to change. They're not going to grow. They want nothing to do with it. Then you, are, you cannot expect to grow. But if you come and you want to hear the milk of the word and you want to grow thereby, then, uh, then that'll happen. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 1, the Bible reads, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder. An elder is just a pastor. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, the bishop or the deacon in the church. He's an elder. The elder which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. This is an, an one elder, Peter, two other elders. And he's exhorting them and saying, look, you need to feed the flock of God. You need to take the wisdom and the words of God and teach that unto the church members. You need to teach that unto them. And he says, taking the oversight thereof, you know, managing and running the church, not by constraint, not because you have to, but willingly serving God, taking on this job and this role of overseeing the church and feeding the flock because you want to, because you want to serve God. And he says, not for filthy lucre. Don't do it for money. There's plenty of preachers out there that are preaching for money. They're all over the place. And that's where you start getting into the heresies and the false doctrines. And that's where the places you're going to go. You're never going to hear a sin being taught on because guess what? Sometimes when people get, get, uh, hear sins being taught on, they're going to leave because they get offended, because they, they feel like you're picking on them or whatever. And they didn't say, I didn't come here to hear you, you know, uh, preach about my sins, and they're going to leave. Well, if you're preaching just for money, you're not going to touch that stuff. You're going to be telling, hey, everything's just great. Everything's fine. Come on in here. I'll make you feel real good. And you could be a great motivational speaker and you'll get plenty of people to come in and fill the speech and you could, you could pass around the play. I mean, look at Joel Osteen. The prime example. He's filling up coliseums. He's filling up these huge arenas. And he passes that plate around. He passes it around again. And he lives in you know multi-billion dollar mansion. I don't, I don't know how much money it is. Multi-million dollar mansion. He gets so much money because he is preaching for filthy lucre's sake. That's why he's doing it. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing. He, he looks good. He says sometimes you might say the right thing. Oh, he's just so nice. He's got such a great smile, doesn't he? He's a wolf. He's preaching for filthy lucre's sake. He says, But of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And that's really important. You know, that's what impressed me the most, most when I went to Faithful Word is that the pastor there, Pastor Anderson, is not someone who lords over the flock, but he leads by example. And you know what? That's something you're going to find here too. I am not going to ask you guys to do anything that I won't do myself. When, it, when we have the memory verses, I learn them too. When we go out and we have these soul winning times, guess what? I'm here at all the soul winning times. I go out and do that too. I am not going to do anything and sell, tell you, well, you need to be doing this, but I got other things to do. The pastor will be someone that leads by example. And that's another thing that's liking a lot of churches these days too. Look, before, one of the reasons, probably the main reason why I even decided to become a pastor to begin with is because of the other churches I visited that, and, and this was after going to church for a while and learning a lot and trying to seek out, when we would go on vacation, we would travel, we'd go to different places, and I'd be like, let's try to find the best church in the area that we can go to in this town. And, and doing as much research as possible, calling up pastors, looking at their statements of faith, seeing what do they believe in. Okay, they're King James only, amen. They believe in salvation by grace through faith, and they have a soul wing program, let's go there. And you see and hear almost nothing being taught and the pastor's not going out soul winning, and there's all these things that are problems with it, and it, the churches are dying. And they're dying all across America. And I remember sitting in these churches and just thinking, like, 
You're reading the chapter, but you're skipping over all of this stuff. Like, this is good stuff. Why don't you preach this? And it's just kind of going right over it. I'm not going to sit and complain about this stuff. I fit the, the qualifications, and I feel that God has, has led me to say, I'm gonna, I want you to, to preach my word and become a pastor of, of a church. And that's what God had for my life. And after seeing all the different churches that I've been through, um, that's the reason why I decided to do this. And it's all over the place. And I hear it from plenty of people also, the same exact story, that they go to churches and it just seems to be something lacking. It seems to be the, this, this lack of preaching the whole counsel of God. The church is supposed to be a place where you can hear the entire Bible preached. And also a place where you can see the power of God in people's lives as his word takes root. See, it's one thing just to get saved, right? The seed uh, of God's word produces life when you're born again and you have that new life. But we need to be rooted and founded in his word and, and get in his word and, and know his word so that we don't get offended, so that we don't get shaken, so that when persecutions and trials and tribulations arise, that we're not just, just off and out of church and back into the world again. And one of the ways that you're going to get right with God and, and get rooted and founded is when there's preaching like Isaiah 58.1. You don't have to turn there. Isaiah 58.1 says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. This was something that for Isaiah that he needed to do. He needed to cry aloud. He needed to spare not. Don't hold anything back. Look, people can handle it. All, you know, oftentimes, and this is something that, that the flesh will try to get you to say, you know, where, where I've been um, experienced this personally. People come into the church, you feel like, oh, they're kind of a new believer. I don't know if they could really handle God's word. Look, it's God's word. You don't need to censor it. You don't need to hold anything back. They're a grown person. They're an adult. They can handle it. And this is the way I've always wanted to be treated. Look, I'm an adult. Just tell me the way it is. I just want to hear the truth. Don't hold back. Don't water it down. Don't try to give me just a little piece here. Look, look tell me the whole thing. Amen. Just, just speak it out and preach it. I can handle it. I'm a big boy. You know, give it to me. Give it to me raw. Give it to me uncut. Tell me what the word's saying here. And if it's my sin, then it's my sin. I'll deal with that with God. But I want to be convicted. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. This is a passage I like to, to turn to, especially out soul winning. You know, when someone just gets saved, they want to explain the importance of coming to church and why it's so important. Because we spend a lot of time, especially when you're trying to win someone to Christ, explaining that it's not based on your church attendance. It's not based on your good deeds. It's not based on your good works that will get you into heaven. And we do that sometimes so much to a point to where they think that, well, once they get saved, then they don't got to do anything. And now, for salvation, of course you don't have to do anything. But I also want to try to balance that out after a person receives Christ and say, okay, you're saved now. You can do whatever you want. You're still saved because you're born again because you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That faith is what saves you. However, as a child of God, God has expectations for you. God has certain things that he wants you to do. God wants you to get baptized. If you're a born again believer, God commands that you should be baptized. If you're a born-again believer, look, God wants you to be in church. God wants you to read the Bible. God wants you to learn and to grow. So I'll show them here in Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse number 11. This is, the, this is what I was alluding to earlier. This is talking about God. Actually, let's jump up to verse number 8. Verse number 8 says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Talking about Christ giving specific gifts gifts unto men. Now, if God's giving us a gift, he's giving us a gift to use it, not just to, to store in a closet. And then we have a parenthetical statement in 9 and 10. Look at verse number 11. And he gave some, he's talking about these gifts that he's given. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists 
and some pastors and teachers. These are all leaders within the church, right? The apostles back in Jesus' day, the prophets, evangelists, people who are going around and preaching the gospel, and pastors and teachers. God has given gifts unto men to be able to do these things, to perform these functions. And it's not so that everyone could just say, oh yeah, I don't need church. I have church in my living room. God didn't give these gifts to not be used. Obviously, they have a purpose. Look at what the purpose is. Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The reason why these gifts to, uh, that were given to people for pastors and for teachers and for evangelists is for the perfecting of the saints, is to, to make you better to make you a better Christian, to, to help the work of the ministry of Christ and for edifying the body of Christ. The believers that come together are the body of Christ. It is for your edification. It's for your own good to come to church and to hear what's been given uh, of these gifts of these men. Verse number 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God wants us to be in unity in our faith. Now, the way that you do that, when you, when you all come together and you hear teaching in the church, we should all be coming together in unity, in agreement, and saying, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Now, when you have a bunch of people just scattered all over the place, not coming to church, everyone's going to have all kinds of different beliefs. You know, oftentimes, I remember this, you know, as someone who's saved, you could say, oh, I don't need some man to tell me what I need to believe. Well, then why did God even ordain the position of a pastor, of a teacher? Why, why did God even, even give these roles to be filled of teachers and evangelists if you can just get everything on your own? Now look, I believe that once you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit residing inside of you. But I also believe you still need someone to help to lead you and guide you into truth and wisdom. You need to have that, 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 that um, guidance from people who are more experienced, who are more grown in the faith. As a baby, right, you think about the, the Bible likens us when we get born again as being babes in Christ. As we read in 1 Peter chapter 2, it says, you know, desire the sincere milk of the word as newborn babes. When you're a newborn babe, you can't expect a newborn babe to understand calculus or algebra, or all these other things, you know, anything that's a little bit more complicated. Newborn babes understand very little. They need to grow, and they need to be taught things in order to grow. Now, the Holy Ghost is capable of teaching all of us completely, but I believe that God uses the, the men that He has ordained to be in these positions of teachers and pastors in order to help your learning and to help your process. When I, would, when I would read the Bible on my own, I even remember, because I have notes that I would write down of things that I was thinking when I was trying to study the Bible before I was in church, before I was doing anything. And I wasn't just completely way off base, but there was a lot. I could, I could try to remember, like, man, what was I even thinking when I was, when I was reading through some of this stuff? It wasn't completely unclear to me, but it wasn't completely clear either. A lot of the stuff I was trying to fumble in around. But once I got into a good church and, and good, solid teaching, it, it makes perfect sense. And you start looking through the scripture, and it's a lot easier to find out where something is wrong. Um, when you hear someone preach something, it's a lot easier to be able to identify that, especially the more you get to know your Bible. When people are teaching you things and false doctrine, it should be easier to spot and say, you know what, that's not right because that contradicts something else that I read in the Bible. But when it's right, and then you got the Holy Spirit confirming that, you're saying, you know what, I'm hearing this, this makes sense, this lines up, this is exactly what the Bible's saying right here, and you know you're hearing the truth, and that is going to help you to grow. Um, the Bible says in verse 14 here in Ephesians chapter 4, that we henceforth, so from here forward, be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Look, there's a lot of people that are going to try to deceive you with false doctrine. He's saying they're out there. And this is one of the reasons why you ought to be coming to church and hearing from the teachers and pastors so that people aren't going to just be able to deceive you by the sleight of hand and try to show you a verse. Say, See, look, this is what the Bible says. 
And when you don't know very much, it's easier to be deceived about that as opposed to when you have somebody like the Apostle Paul was trying to do. He's warning you, say, hey, look, there's going to be wolves. They're going to come in. They're going to be among you. And I'm warning you. I'm warning you. I'm warning you. Watch out for these people. Watch out for them. They're going to come to you. They're going to, they're going to look like they're good. They're going to start to sound like they're good, but they're wolves. And you need to watch out for them. They're not going to spare the flock. And he's dedicated his life to teaching and, and to, to writing these epistles and saying, look, this is good doctrine. You need to learn this. And this is the pastor's job also and the, and the teacher's job within the church to be able to teach these things and say, look, this is sound doctrine. This is what the Bible says. We're going to go through it very clearly. We're going to use a lot of evidence from all over the Bible to support our doctrine so that you don't get deceived by people who are real crafty with God's word. They're real subtle and they're able to just try, they, they lie in wait trying to deceive people. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, According to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Again, he's trying to say there's a difference here. One of the reasons you come to church and you hear from the pastors is so that you can be different from the other Gentiles. He said, don't walk like they walk. You shouldn't have the same entertainment that they have. You shouldn't be having the same conversations that they have. You need to be different. You are peculiar people. You need to be serving God. And this is another thing that you ought to be finding in a good church. Is a pastor or a teacher that is able to show you the difference between the clean and the unclean. This is the right way to walk. Look, if you're doing things that are unclean, get the uncleanness out of your life. Cleanse yourself and get right with God and do that which is right. But they need to at least start off by saying, you know what, Hollywood is wicked as hell and you ought to have nothing to do with it. And guess what? Disney is a part of that Hollywood. Walt Disney is, is a wicked man and you, you know we ought not to be letting our little girls, we don't ever let our little girls watch that garbage. You know, oh, what's wrong with it? It's for kids. It's just about princesses. No, look, there's a lot of trash that goes on in there. There's a lot of magic and, and, and wicked philosophies and, and anti-God um, themes that go on in those, in those films. Don't just think that, oh, it must be, it's just fine because it's for kids. No, those are the most subtle of all. Same thing with the music industry. I mean, now they're just openly coming out and worshiping Satan on stage. Now there's just like no more, no more hiding the fact that they worship the devil. Literally. I mean, they come out, they, they, a lot of times, they, I think, in their concerts, they just get completely naked on stage. No shame whatsoever. They glory in their shame. These reprobates that the Bible talks about, Romans 1, they glory in their shame. They hate God. They curse God. And they want to have nothing to do with God. And these are, this is what the world ele elevates. And this is, this is going to be entertainment you're going to see at, like, the halftime of Super Bowl. This is what, you know, you know, because what's the Super Bowl? It's like the most watched event in, in all of television, right? The most people are going to be watching that. And they get to try to ram their filth down your throat during the halftime show and exalt these God-hating people. Look, it's wicked as hell. You ought not to have anything to do with it and not put that wicked stuff before, in front of your eyes. But without this type of preaching, without hearing this stuff, a lot of people are just going to go along with the flow. We need to be reminded of this stuff and say, hey, look, we're different. I don't want to have anything to do with that nonsense. I don't want to have that in front of my face. Let's keep reading here because this, verse, this chapter is great describing at what we ought to be hearing and, and uh, learning from church. He says, This I say therefore, verse 17, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart to being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, 
and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. All of these things, he's saying, look, you've got a new, new creature. You've got a new man inside of you now. You've got the Spirit of God residing inside of you. Don't be like your old self. Don't be like, look, you need to change. You need to be different. We all still have the same old flesh. All of the things that you like to do before you got saved, your flesh is still going to want to do those things that are bad. My flesh still wants to go out to the bar and drink and get drunk. My flesh still wants to do things that are wicked in the sight of God. But now I've got the new man. Now you've got the new man. We need to strengthen that new man. We need to walk in God's spirit and put away the deeds of the flesh so that we can be doing what's right. And we're going to get that through, hopefully, in the right church through proper preaching and teaching. Now I'm sure you can go to other churches where there are plenty of friendly people that attend and generous people and people that might be willing to help you out. They exist. Hey, we live in a town here. There's a lot of nice people that live here. They're really nice. They're really friendly. Some of them might even be saved. Okay? And you can go to churches where they're going to greet you. And look, our church ought to be a friendly church. I, I hope to God that everybody that comes here feels real warm and welcome because it is a friendly church. We do, and we love God and we love other people. But just because you go into a church that has friendly people or maybe they're kind of generous, it doesn't mean that that's the right church for you to be in. It doesn't mean that that's the church that God wants you to be in. Because a lot of these churches you're going to go into, they're, they're, they're real nice, they're real friendly, and I bet the preaching is probably real comfortable too. And that nobody's going to have any problems with what's being said. You'll hear all about the love of God. And it's probably going to be very seldom when you actually hear a sermon about sin. Especially something that's really specific that just gets down right to the point. Just says, you know what, this specifically is a sin. Men, that you look on a woman and you have lust after them. That is like you're committing adultery with them already in your heart. And that is wickedness. Nail it down. Say, look, the Bible says not to even look on alcohol, not to even look on the wine when it's red, when it gives its color in the cup. So Christian, don't go home and just say, oh, well, I've got a six-pack and a beer. I'm just going to have a beer. I drink occasionally. Look, the Bible says don't even look at it. It's wickedness. Let's just break it down and say, you know, this is a sin. Thus saith the Lord, you shouldn't be doing these things. If you want to be right with God, you shouldn't be doing these things. It's easy to just coast through life with that warm and fuzzy feeling until the day that you die. But this is going to be my final point. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's easy to get caught up into that in these churches that aren't really doing anything. You come in, it's like a social club, you've got your friends, you talk to, you see them once a week, and then you go home and, and you feel nice and you feel good. You're not being challenged. You're not being fed. You're not, you're not hearing things say, oh man, I need to work on this a little bit more. You're not hearing any of that. You come in, you feel good, you hear a motivational speaker, you go home, you come back, you repeat. You do the same thing over and over again. That's how most churches are these days. I'll tell you what, it's going to be a sad day at the judgment seat of Christ for a lot of Christians, a lot of believers who are going through the motions like that and who aren't getting in good churches and who aren't getting uh, uh, challenged in order to do more for Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. It says, Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. So he's saying, look, 
God has given us the earnest of the Spirit. That's a down payment. He says, we know that we're saved because we've got the earnest of the Spirit. So we are always confident that while we are in this body, we're not with the Lord in heaven. But we have the earnest of the Spirit in that when we do finally depart from this body, we will be present with the Lord. This is our confidence. We know that because we have the earnest of the Spirit. But he says, because of this, because we know that we're always saved, we're going to be present with the Lord one day. We're going to be in His presence. We labor. We work. We work hard that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. Now, we know we're in His family. We know He's not going to cast us into hell, but there is an acceptance that we want to have of our Heavenly Father. It's the same way with my children. Look, they're always looking to me for acceptance. They, they want to do things to please me. They want to be doing things that are acceptable and that I will say, yes, you did a very good job. He's not talking about salvation here. People try to, to twist this and say like, oh yeah, see, you have to work or else you're not going to be accepted, which means they're going to send you hell. No. You're already his child. Just like my children, even if they disobey everything I, I tell them, I'm going to be very disappointed with them. They're not going to be accepted, but they're still part of my family and I still love them. The acceptance that we gain and what we're looking for is trying to please God and make Him happy. We're looking for that acceptance. He says, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of Him. Verse number 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done whether it be good or bad. Now, this is not talking about our sins. God is not going to judge us for all of our sins. But there is a judgment seat of Christ that we are going to stand before. Every single believer in Christ is going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And all of the works that you've done in your whole life is going to be heaped up and thrown down at the feet of Jesus Christ. And it's going to be tried by fire. And the things that you've done in your life that had eternal value, that actually mattered, the things that would be considered acceptable unto God, that's going to last. That's going to make it through that fire. But the things that you did that had nothing to do with God, that doesn't have eternal value, that didn't really mean everything, anything like just showing up to church and having going to your social club meeting, that's going to be burned up. God's going to say, that didn't do anything for the cause of Christ. How did you get anybody else to come to Christ and to put their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ just because you showed up and checked off your checkbox on the calendar? He said, that does nothing. Eternal value are the way that you impact other people's lives and get them to serve God. And you have the same mind that Christ had that said, you know what? It doesn't matter what happens to me. I'm willing to sacrifice my whole body and my whole self and, and, and offer myself up as a sacrifice so that you all can be bettered, so that you all can be saved. And when we have that type of a mindset, then we're going to start doing things that have eternal value in the sight of God. Well, we can start to say, you know what? I've got other things to do this weekend. I've got other things to do on Sunday. I've got other things to do on Wednesday, but I'm going to go out and I'm going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ so that someone else can get saved so that they can go to heaven. Hey, that has eternal value in God's eyes. God looks at that and he says, that is great. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That is what's going to abide the fire at the day, at the judgment seat of Christ. He says, there, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Do you want to do something that matters with your life? Or would you rather just waste your time on this earth and have all of your works burned up at the judgment seat? We have that choice. I mean, you could do what you want. You could live the comfortable life. You could go to the comfortable church. You could, you could, you could feel good about yourself and feel good about everything that you do and, and, and trick yourself into thinking that you don't really have any sins and everything you do is just fine and, that, and, and there's no room for growth. You've already made it. I've achieved my, I achieved my spiritual growth. I am a full-grown adult and, and there's nothing else that I need and, uh, and I'm just great. You could, you could have that mentality, but I'll tell you what, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And ultimately, he's going to serve it. And, and you know, if you want to try to deceive yourself and trick yourself that way, look, I don't think that I am, gonna, I am that worthy. I have a lot of room to grow as a pastor, as an individual, as, as a believer. There's a lot of things that I want to do more for Christ. I still have sins in my life. I don't trick myself. I know that I have sins that I need to get out of my life, as all of you do too. 
But hopefully you have the right mindset of wanting to get right with God, of wanting to be exposed to these things and say, hey, I didn't even know that. I would love for that. Isaiah. I didn't even know that this was a sin. Now I can get this right with God. God, I'm sorry that I've been doing this ignorantly for so long. Please have mercy on me. But Lord, I'm not going to do that anymore because now I know what the, your word says. I'm going to do what's right from here on out. So hopefully, if you do, you know, people come and go in church, good people, God-fearing people, you know, other things happen in life, and I get that, where, where life leads you in other directions, maybe God's calling you in another area, but we all need to make sure that we have the right mindset of what a church should be and what we need to be looking for in a church. If you do end up getting separated for some reason, you don't end up coming to this church forever, which I would love for you to be here for forever, but um, if, if something happens and you're not here, always make sure that you're looking for the things that are most important. Prioritize it for yourself. But if you want to use what I think are the most important things, salvation, the King James Bible, and some type of soul winning being done at a church, those are three things that you ought to be looking at and looking at closely and say, you know what, this church needs to have these things. And if I'm going to move to an area, I better make sure that there's something a church that has at least these three things that we could be a part of so that our family doesn't suffer, so that I don't suffer from growth. Because it's you know, once you get out of church, once you get away from, from the edification and the other like-minded believers, it's a lot easier to go into the world. Because you get surrounded and hit by the world and worldliness all the time. I mean, it's a non-stop barrage and attack. And it's a lot easier to start backsliding when you're not being challenged, when you're not going to good church, when you're going to a place and everyone's, you know, it's, it's easy to fall into that trap. It really is. It's just, and that's human nature. No matter how good you are as a Christian, it's easy to fall into that. We need to be making sure that we're moving forward in our Christian life. And the, the, the best way to do that is by going to a good church where people are being sent out and being challenged. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the good churches that do exist, dear Lord. I pray that you would please stir up uh, the people here to want to serve you more. And also, um, anyone else who might be listening to the sermon, dear God, I pray that you would please stir up their souls to get to a good church if they live in an area where there isn't one. Lord, I pray that you would please just build our church. Help us to, to get more like-minded believers, dear God. Help us to reach the lost and to disciple them, dear Lord, and to get them baptized and to start serving you, Lord. We pray that you would please use us as your ministers that we can go forth and to do the work that you've laid out before us. God, help us to um, never underestimate the importance of coming to church and uh, knowing which church we ought to be a part of, dear God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.